Have you ever wondered how pilots get into VFR and IMC accidents? Or how a pilot flying IFR in the clouds can lose control? And do you know how to calculate the bank angle required to get a standard rate turn? Please stick around and we'll answer those questions and more. Hello, my name is Max Truscott. I've been flying for 50 years. I'm the author of several books and I'm the 2008 National Flight Instructor of the Year. And my mission is to help you become the safest possible pilot. If you're new to this show, please take a moment right now and touch either the subscribe key or if you're using the Apple podcast app, the follow key so that next week's episode is downloaded for free. Last week, we talked about using vectors to final the activate approach command and read many of your emails on the topic. So if you didn't hear that episode, you may want to check it out at aviationnewstalk.com slash 308. And of course, this is a listener supported show supported by people like you. And we've got several new ways that you can show your love and support for the show. So please, when you get a moment, go out to our new support page at aviationnewstalk.com slash support, where you'll find links to support the show via PayPal, Venmo, the Cash App, Bazell, and Patreon. And when you make a donation, I'll read your name on the show. Coming up on the news for the week of January 1st, 2024, a drone hits a helicopter in Daytona Beach. A report says changes are needed at the FAA's Air Traffic Control Training Center, and a plane was stolen from a Las Vegas airport, and we'll tell you where it ended up. All this and more on the news starts now. From abc.net.au, Japan Airlines plane collides with another aircraft at Tokyo's Haneda Airport. Five people were killed when a smaller government plane on the runway was hit by a Japan Airlines Airbus A350. All 379 people on the passenger plane made it out alive before flames engulfed the plane. As the Japan Airlines plane touched down and rolled out on the runway, it collided with a smaller aircraft operated by the Japanese Coast Guard. The smaller of the planes exploded, sending a fireball into the sky. The smaller plane, a Dash 8, had been preparing to deliver aid to earthquake-ravaged parts of the country's west coast. Sadly, of the six people on board, only the pilot survived. At least 17 people on the passenger plane were injured. The airline said the evacuation began almost immediately after the plane came to a stop and that all passengers were taken to safety within less than 20 minutes. Witnesses estimate the plane was engulfed by flames 10 minutes later. Investigations are underway. Early indications suggest that the captain of the JAL flight had been given the appropriate permission to land. The Coast Guard pilot maintains he was also given permission to take off. Reuters said transcripts of the air traffic control instructions released by authorities appeared to show the JAL jet had been given permission to land, while the Coast Guard aircraft had been told to taxi to a holding point near the runway. An official from Japan's Civil Aviation Bureau told reporters there were no indications in those transcripts that the Coast Guard aircraft had been granted permission to take off. From CBS12.com, drone hits helicopter near Daytona Beach. A helicopter crashed into a drone on Saturday. Luckily, no one was injured from the collision. At around 2 p.m., a helicopter with leading-edge helicopter tours struck a drone flying near the Daytona Beach flea market. Fortunately, the helicopter was able to land safely, but damage to the rotor blade is estimated to be around $60,000. Deputies were able to make contact with both the helicopter pilot and the drone operator. The operator of the drone said he was recording a video at 180 feet. He was looking down at his tablet when he heard a loud impact. He then noticed his drone was no longer in the air. The pilot told deputies he saw the drone through his windshield, but was unable to avoid a collision. From Oklahoman.com, report says changes needed at FAA's Air Traffic Controller Training Center in Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City's FAA Training Center for Air Traffic Controllers could see significant changes after a report describing the nation's shortage of people tasked with controlling the airspace. The National Airspace System Safety Review Team report published in November identified bottlenecks at the FAA Academy that prevent the FAA from training enough controllers to meet demand. On the current trajectory, the nation will see only a modest increase by the year 2032. The team recommended the Academy's culture, training atmosphere, and teaching methods be examined to find out whether those factors cause trainees to wash out of the program. Officials recommended that the facility increase hours of operation and hire more instructors and reduce outdated curriculum. The FAA was also told to consider offering courses virtually and at other facilities around the country. The report found a failure rate of over 30% for air traffic controller trainees. The controller shortage is already testing the limits of capacity in the skies. 
According to the union, air traffic controllers in many facilities are working at mandatory overtime with 10-hour shifts, six days per week. From avweb.com, Delta Airlines intends to scale back pilot hiring next year to half the number the carrier hired in 2023, an indication that the post-pandemic hiring spree is slowing down. Aero Crew News first broke the story after obtaining a Flight Ops Weekly internal memo to pilots outlining Delta's intention to hire 1,100 pilots, a significant reduction compared to peak hiring figures in 2023, which reached 2,200. But despite Delta's latest announcement, the company reminds its crew that the projected hiring figure is still well above average. The Wall Street Journal, which also reviewed the memo, highlighted the airline's message. Quote, remember that any other year, hiring 1,100 pilots would be considered an incredibly high number. Data from pilot career advisory firm FAPA.Aero shows major carriers are on track to hire 13,000 pilots this year, consistent with last year's staggering figures. Still, while travel demand continues to hold steady, some carriers have joined Delta in adjusting their hiring pace. Following a disappointing third quarter, Spirit Airlines suspended pilot and cabin crew training, while cargo operators such as FedEx suggested its pilots look to join other U.S. carriers. From KVL.com, NTSB says Afghan refugee in Oregon training flight crash that killed three ignored flight instructor's advice. A former Afghan Air Force pilot training for a commercial license in Oregon ignored his flight instructor's advice to not return to a small airport because of low visibility. The plane later crashed, killing the pilot and two other passengers on board, according to a preliminary NTSB report. All three men killed in the accident December 16th were former Afghan pilots who fought with the American military. The NTSB's report said an examination of the airframe and the engine of the Cessna 172 airplane revealed no mechanical malfunctions or failures. The plane's owner allowed the pilot to use the Cessna to get his private pilot certificate and to obtain his instrument rating and commercial pilot certificate, the report said. The accident pilot reportedly told his flight instructor that he and a pilot-rated passenger would fly from Independence to the McMinnville Airport to practice instrument approaches. Two approaches were made at McMinnville before the plane landed. The flight instructor, who was monitoring the flight, called the pilot and advised him not to return to Independence because of low visibility of about 500 feet due to fog. The pilot told the instructor that he would fly to Independence, assess the situation, and either attempt to land, divert to Salem, or return to McMinnville. He also said he had picked up a second pilot-rated passenger in McMinnville. ATC recordings indicate the pilot made two position reports on approach that included his intentions to land in Independence. The pilot overshot the runway to the east, overcorrected, and overshot it to the west, and came to rest inverted on the edge of an open field next to airport property. The plane likely first hit an 80-foot utility pole located about 60 feet southeast of the wreckage. The report noted that the pole had a dual lamp red warning light attached to the top, and it was also found in the wreckage. At least one power line was also found in the wreckage. From avweb.com, dual engine failure leads to off-airport landing. A rare dual engine failure is being cited in the injury-free off-airport landing of a light Piper twin, possibly a twin Comanche, on Saturday in Kansas. Lane County Sheriff's Department said the plane lost both engines and the pilot put it down on a field. The pilot and the two passengers weren't hurt. The sheriff's department did not say what caused both engines to quit at the same time. The FAA and NTSB will be investigating. And some of the comments on this article suggested that the problem might have been fuel-related, which is certainly one of the few things that can cause both engines to fail at the same time. And finally, from Fox5Vegas.com, plane stolen from the North Las Vegas airport. After a series of burglaries earlier in the week, a plane was stolen Saturday evening out of the North Las Vegas airport and landed in the middle of the desert near Barstow, California. Police said a 2020 Kit Fox was burglarized by a 40-year-old suspect sometime after 2 p.m. on December 30th. Police said the suspect took off with a plane and landed in a field near the Barstow Daggett Airport. According to the plane's owner, the plane was found with part of a marijuana joint on the floor and numerous beer cans and bottles in the cockpit. When asked to move the plane by authorities, it was unable to fly back to Las Vegas due to the damage to the propeller and the engine. The owner found a binder opened up to a specific page with instructions on landing at an airport in Corona, California. The plane's owner tells Fox 5 they were alerted to the theft by the Air Force, who called them to ask if they had crashed or made a hard landing outside Barstow. 
an ELT sensor, alert authorities about a possible accident. Police say the suspect is responsible for three burglaries to other planes on December 27th, 28th, and 29th, and noted that one of the planes was burglarized twice. The owner of one of the planes tells Fox 5 he raised concerns to investigators twice that someone appeared to try to steal his plane. He told Fox 5 he found his plane untied, a cover removed, and the master switch turned on. The locks were also damaged. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up next, a few of my updates. And later, we'll talk about recent VFR into IMC and other loss of control accidents. All right here on the Aviation News Talk Podcast. And let's get to the good news. First, congratulations to Aaron Stefanida. He says he passed his instrument check right in his SR-22. Congratulations. And congratulations to Robert Shapiro. He's passed his CFI for gyroplanes. You may recall that we had him on here on episode 290, talking about how you can do a gyroplane add-on to your certificate. And he also wrote, I'm listening to episode 308 right now while charging my car. Why that's significant is that you mentioned the tragic crash of the news helicopter in Philadelphia and how you used to work for WCAU Channel 10. I'm literally driving back from Papa 72 right now, where I spent the last nine hours covering the Sky Force 10 helicopter evening shift. How ironic. Yeah, fascinating. I don't think that uh, they even had a helicopter back in the 70s when I was there. I seem to recall that it was only Channel 6 that had one at the time. And if you have good news to share, just go ahead and shoot me an email. Easy way to do it. Go out to aviationnewstalk.com. Click on contact at the top of the page. Let's talk about standard rate turns. Standard rate turn is defined as a three degree per second turn which means that it will take you two minutes to complete a 360 degree turn. So this is known as a two minute turn and it's the rate at which aircraft fly when they are flying IFR. And the reason we use a standard rate turn when we turn is so that it provides a reference for controllers and pilots so that they'll know what to expect from each other, how quickly the aircraft will be turning. There's another reason too, and that is that it keeps the bank angle relatively shallow. We've talked about some accidents here where Pilots got steep bank angles and then lost control in IMC. And it's important for pilots to know just what bank angle is required to get a standard rate turn. And that bank angle changes with your airspeed. The faster you are, the steeper the bank angle has to be to get a standard rate turn. So I always like to have an estimate of what bank angle is going to be required in an aircraft I'm flying. That way, when I make a turn, I just bank to the approximate angle that's required. Then I look at the turn coordinator to see if it's properly set for a two minute turn. And if it's not, I just make tiny corrections to the bank angle. So anytime you're making a turn, if you know what that bank angle is, as you scan your attitude indicator, you can quickly confirm that you're close to the bank angle that you should be at. Now there's a somewhat complicated formula for calculating the bank angle for a standard rate turn based on your airspeed, but there are two easy rules of thumb that you could use. One of which is to just take 15% of your true airspeed. So if you're flying at 100 knots, 15% of that's going to be 15 degrees. That would be the bank angle that you turn to to try and generate a standard rate turn. Or there's another formula, which is to take 10% of your true airspeed and add 5 degrees. So once again, at 100 knots, take 10% of that. That's 10, add 5, and you get 15 degrees. So for example, if I were flying a 172, 15 degrees of bank is about what it takes to get a standard rate turn. If I'm flying in a Cirrus, which is somewhat faster, I usually see that I'm somewhere around 19 or 20 degrees of bank angle to get a standard rate turn. So keep that in mind anytime that you're flying on instruments. And I want to take a moment and tell you about the Palm Springs Air Museum in Palm Springs, California. A couple of weeks ago when I was in Southern California at USC to take the aircraft accident investigation course, the director of the program, Tom Anthony, told us before the weekend that the museum was definitely worth visiting. And so I took a drive out to Palm Springs for two reasons. One, I've been there eh, at least three times in the past and have never been able to take the uh, the tramway. I wanted to uh, take that. It goes up pretty high to the side of a mountain. And since Tom mentioned the Palm Springs Air Museum, I decided I would check it out. Now, I have to tell you, I generally don't spend a lot of time in air museums. It's just not my thing. But I was very impressed with this museum. They have a lot of aircraft. They're all in excellent condition. The facilities are in excellent condition. Clearly, they've had a fair amount of money to to get this in good shape. Probably the thing I enjoyed most 
was paying an extra five or maybe it was ten dollars to walk around the inside of an airworthy B-17 bomber. And it turns out they actually have two airworthy B-17 bombers. They don't fly them, but they say they're both airworthy. And I started by crawling up into the front of the airplane where I could look into the cockpit and then down below could see where the bombardier was located. And then as I walked back through the airplane, there were two things that struck me. The first was just how narrow the catwalk is to get from the front of the airplane to the back. Now, it's pretty narrow because you're walking between where the two sets of bombs were stored. And I was also amazed as I got to the back of the airplane at just how small the crawl space was to get to the tail gunner's station in the tail of the plane. It's very far back behind the waist gunners, and it looks like you'd have to be a fairly small person to uh, to take that position. So it was fascinating to walk through this uh, really pristine condition B-17 just to get a feel for what it was like for the people who served in these aircraft during World War II. Now, the museum was also giving rides in several airplanes, including a C-47 Skytrain and a P-51 Mustang. So I'd encourage you, anytime that you're in the Palm Springs area, check out the Palm Springs Air Museum. Now, aviation is a very small community, so take a moment to see if you know any of these people who've just signed up in the past week to help support Aviation News Talk. First, we have two new mega supporters. These are the folks who do the heavy lifting of the show. They donate $50 a month or more, and after two months, I send them a copy of one of my books. First, thanks to Aaron Elder. He writes that he and his partners have a SF-50 Vision Jet available for rent at Apogee Air at the Oakland International Airport in Oakland County, Michigan. That's KPTK. Aaron, thanks for letting us know about that, and thanks for supporting the show. And also thanks to Tom Higgins. He writes he's a student pilot that he started his training over 20 years ago at the San Carlos Airport in California, which is close by here. But he says he's now learning to fly in an SR-20 at All In Aviation out of Henderson, Nevada. Tom, thank you so much for supporting the show. And we have several other new supporters on Patreon. Thanks to John Kingsley, Aaron Benjamin, and Sam Dawson, who writes to us often. He's edited his pledge upwards. We also had one-time donations from Dane Jasper. That was via Apple Cash. We had a PayPal donation from Mark Wilson and a one-time Venmo donation from Chris Keynes. And if you'd like to join these fine people and join the club to help support the show, it's really simple, easy to do. We've got a brand new support page at aviationnewstalk.com slash support. And it'll tell you how you can donate via PayPal, Venmo, the Cash App, Zelle, or Patreon. And of course, when you do, we'll read your name on the show. Coming up next, we're going to be talking about recent VFR into IMC accidents and other loss of control accidents, all right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. VFR into IMC accidents continue to be a problem for us as GA pilots. Not only are there too many of them, but they also have the highest lethality rate of any accident type, as 90% of these accidents are fatal. Two years ago in episode 228, in what had been our most downloaded episode to that date, Rob Mark and I talked about VFR into IMC, and he pointed out that this is a uniquely general aviation problem. Here's what he said. VFR into IMC is a problem that we don't see in the in the commercial world. I mean, I looked at some accident data before we started, and the Flight Safety Foundation puts out a, uh, a safety report every year. And there were certainly commercial accidents. Now, they're looking at data worldwide, but there isn't even a category for VFR flight into IMC because professional pilots don't find themselves in those situations. This is the kind of thing that people in small aircraft do because they think they're invulnerable, maybe. And I worry that there may be people who've tuned out already thinking, oh, VFR and IMC, this is just trivial. It's simple. All I have to do is stay out of a cloud. That's all there is to it. And what I really want people to understand is, no, even highly experienced pilots sometimes find themselves in this situation. It's happened to both you and it's happened to me twice. And in both cases, I think we were doing everything possible to try to avoid doing it. So for me, the key point, I think, is let people know, hey, you may think that, oh, this will never happen to you. And as a younger pilot, I used to always think about all the stuff I read, different kinds of things. Oh, that'll never happen to me. And then some of those things started happening to me. And eventually I realized, oh, I guess mom lied to me. I'm not special. And so I think, first of all, we have to realize 
that if you fly enough, VFR into IMC might indeed happen to you. Now for today's episode, I searched the NTSB database for all final reports released in the month of December. And then I skimmed through all of those reports that had fatalities. And I didn't really have any expectation of what I might find. But I did find a number of accidents that involved VFR and IMC or loss of control while in weather of some type. So we'll talk about some of those accidents today. But first, one of the things we talked about in episode 228 was what was then a new course from AOPA's Air Safety Institute called VFR and IMC Avoidance and Escape. It's a great course, and I'll talk more about the key points it makes at the end of the episode. And I've included a link to it in the show notes so that you can take the course. Here's one of my comments from 228 that mentions a key point from that course. And I thought they made a number of really excellent points. For example, they said that the VFR and IMC, the term gets used generically. I love this. In truth, there are hundreds of different scenarios, each with its own unique mix of judgment, circumstance, experience, and luck. And I think you and I have kind of talked about how it's kind of tough to characterize these accidents because they, they happen in just a multitude of ways. Another thing we talked about in that episode was an FAA study that looked at human factors in VFR and IMC accidents. It found a number of differences between VFR and IMC accidents and other types of accidents. One thing it found is that with VFR and IMC accidents, the accident pilots had fewer total hours than pilots who had other kinds of accidents. And yet the median, that is the number at which half the pilots have more and half the accident pilots had fewer hours, the median for VFR and IMC accidents was 731 hours of flight experience. So you might have guessed that these accidents mostly happen to pilots with two or 300 hours or less, but they also happen to high time pilots. For example, locally in this area, we had a VFR and IMC accident with a 10,000 hour pilot who was moving a Cessna caravan between two airports about 40 miles apart. So as we talk about these accidents today, keep in mind that there are many ways a VFR into IMC accident can occur and that you need to develop strategies for both avoiding these kinds of accidents and for escaping them if you unexpectedly find yourself in the clouds. This first accident is fairly classic. It involved a commercial rated pilot who felt that he needed to be somewhere, in this case to fly to another airport to get a load of seed for an agricultural spraying job. The accident involved November 8960 Quebec, a Thrush Airs S2R, which is an agriculture aircraft that was on a repositioning flight on November 3, 2021. The pilot attempted to depart Shafter Airport Minter Field, that's MIT, in California's Central Valley early in the morning, but had canceled the flight due to the overcast conditions at MIT. The pilot departed on the accident flight about 11.30 a.m. According to the NTSB, the pilot did not request information from Lighthouse or Forflight. KBFL, Bakersfield Airport, was the closest airport nine miles southeast of the accident site. The TAF for that airport that was valid at the time of the accident expected winds to be calm, half-mile visibility, fog, and an overcast ceiling at 400 feet. The instrument-rated commercial pilot departed from the airport and was planning to conduct a VFR aerial application flight in an airplane that was not equipped for instrument flight rules operation. Shortly after departure, the aircraft entered IMC. The airplane impacted terrain about one and a quarter miles from the departure airport. A witness who spoke with the pilot before the flight stated the pilot said the fog had cleared for a few moments and that he had missed his window to leave. About 20 to 30 minutes later, he heard the pilot's airplane start and take off. Another witness who spoke with the pilot reported that the pilot had been in and out of the office to use the phone and to check weather. His last comment to the witness was, you just have to get high enough over the top of the weather to get in the clear. A third witness, who was at his house about six miles west of the airport, stated that around 12.20 p.m., visibility was one-half to one mile, with patchy fog and low ceilings of about 400 feet AGL. Probable cause, the pilot's decision to depart into IMC, which resulted in spatial disorientation and a subsequent loss of airplane control. This accident, and the next one we'll talk about, is an example of continuation bias. Pilots more commonly refer to that as get their itis or get home itis. It's when you continue with a plan, even when information suggests that the plan should be abandoned. It's an unconscious bias that can appear stronger the closer you get to accomplishing an activity. 
The second accident occurred in Dunsmuir in the far northern part of California. It involved November 5, 268 Quebec, a Cessna 150 that crashed on October 20th, 2021. The pilot had departed on the day before on a multi-leg flight from Squim Valley Airport, Whiskey 28, in Washington State, at about 10 a.m., destined for his home airport of Oscar 37 in Orland, California. During a stop at Independence Airport, that's 7 Sierra 5 in Oregon, a witness reported that the pilot charged the airplane battery as he was having issues with the alternator. The witness offered the pilot assistance to find a replacement alternator, but the pilot refused. Witnesses reported that the pilot was anxious to get home and had a get-there-itis posture. After charging the battery at 7S5, he departed for Ashland Municipal Airport in Ashland, Oregon, that's Sierra Oscar 3, where he spent the night. He departed the next morning about 9.40 a.m. The plane crashed at about 11 a.m. and was discovered on a rising face of Mount Bradley, about 725 feet below the summit, about two miles northwest of Interstate 5. Like the prior accident, there is no record of the pilot requesting information from LIDAS or ForeFlight. At 10.50 a.m., the weather conditions recorded at Dunsmuir Airport, located about three nautical miles northeast of the accident site, were visibility two miles, light rain, cloud scattered at 700 feet, broken at 1,600 feet, and overcast at 2,500 feet. The field elevation there is 3,261 feet, and the elevation of the accident site was about 5,314 feet, so well up in the clouds. A power company lineman supervisor working near Mount Bradley Lookout Point on the day of the accident reported that a fog layer to the top of the mountain was present and allowed for a 200-foot visibility. Between 11 and noon, he heard a low-level airplane flying. He added that the engine sounded as if it was running, but clarified that he did not hear the airplane impact terrain. He further reported that the fog was present for most of the morning and throughout the early afternoon. According to FAA records, the pilot had an expired student pilot certificate and reported flight experience that included 200 total hours and zero hours in the six months before his last aviation medical examiner examination in March 1999, more than 20 years before the crash. At that time, he reported no medication use or active medical conditions, and no significant issues were identified. A family member reported that he was a diabetic. Another witness added that the pilot had been flying as long as he'd owned the airplane, which was about 20 years. The pilot's toxicology testing detected the sedating antihistamine medication diphenhydramine in his urine. Diphenhydramine, marketed under the trade name Benadryl, is an antihistamine used to treat allergies. It's also on the FAA's no-go list, which we'll be talking about on a future show. The FAA says if you take any of the no-go medications, such as Benadryl, you need to wait at least five dosage intervals after the last dose before flying. So, for example, if an over-the-counter medication says it lasts 12 hours and it's on this list, you need to wait 60 hours or two and a half days after you take your last dose before you can fly. Probable cause? The non-certificated pilot's improper decision to continue the flight under VFR into IMC, which resulted in a controlled flight into terrain. Now let's talk briefly about a third VFR into IMC accident. Oddly, all three of these accidents occurred within three and a half weeks of each other, which tells you a little bit about how common these accidents are. This one involved a Robinson R-44 helicopter and occurred in Cornwall, New York on October 10th, 2021 at 1.57 p.m. The NTSB report says the non-instrument rated helicopter pilot was returning to his home airport as the height of the overcast ceiling gradually decreased along the route of flight consistent with the forecast conditions. While flying along the River Valley at an altitude of 1,800 to 1,900 feet above sea level and 100 to 200 feet below the clouds, the helicopter flew beneath an area of light-intensity precipitation echoes as detected by weather radar. It's likely that at this time, the pilot encountered reduced visibility in very light rain and potential clouds. About the same time, the helicopter began to climb and its ground speed decreased. Shortly after climbing above the altitude of the reported cloud ceiling, the helicopter entered a relatively constant rate turn. The report then describes a series of climbs and turns before the helicopter began descending at over 16,000 feet per minute. The pilot, age 73, had 504 hours of total time, including 473 hours in the make and model. The pilot held a private pilot certificate with a rotorcraft helicopter rating. He did not have an instrument rating, which is not at all unusual for helicopter pilots. And by the way, 
One of the things that I was surprised to learn when I started my helicopter instrument rating last year is that none of the Robinson helicopters are certified for flight in the clouds, so you must remain in VMC at all times. A review of the pilot's logbook revealed that he had not recorded any actual or simulated instrument flight experience, and no instrument training was noted in the remarks section of any log entry. In November 2020, one flight was remarked with IFR conditions, ask for special VFR. In May of 2021, one flight was remarked with low clouds, rain, autopilot through the clouds, which of course would not have been legal in an R-44. The non-instrument rated pilots continuing flight into deteriorate weather and condition. Probable cause, the non-instrument rated pilots continued flight into deteriorating weather conditions, which resulted in a loss of control due to spatial disorientation. And you know, here's the really sad thing about this accident. Helicopter pilots have one huge advantage over airplane pilots in deteriorating weather. And that is that when they start to encounter bad weather, they can land virtually anywhere. So there's no reason for a helicopter to continue on in bad weather. Airplane pilots should also divert at the first sign of bad weather, though you need to do it sooner as you'll need to fly further than a helicopter needs to to find a suitable place to land. Now let's talk about a loss of control accident that occurred to a pilot on an instrument departure as he first entered the clouds. This involves November 64 Bravo Romeo, a Piper PA-31350, which is a Navajo chieftain, and it occurred in Medford, Oregon on December 5, 2021 at 4.52 p.m. The NTSB report says, The pilot and passenger made a flight on November 24 from the airplane's home airport in Fallon, Nevada, to Medford. After landing, the pilot noticed the airplane was leaking a large amount of fuel from the right wing route. The pilot arranged to make the necessary repairs with an FBO at the airport and drove a rental car back to Nevada. On December 4th, a mechanic at the FBO notified the pilot that the maintenance to the airplane was completed. The pilot responded that he would plan to get to the airport around 2.30 the following day on the day of the accident. The pilot and passenger drove to Medford, arriving at about 4 p.m. The pilot received an IFR clearance and was issued the Brute 7 departure with a Lanx transition. The published Brute 7 standard departure with a takeoff from runway 14 consists of a climbing right turn direct MEF NDB and continued to the Brute intersection on a bearing of 066. After receiving the clearance, the controller informed the pilot the overcast layer base was at 200 feet above ground, the tops of the layer was at 2,500 feet. After the airplane departed, the pilot made a radio communication to the controller asking, Will you be calling my turn for the Brute 7? The controller replied that he would not be calling his turn and that the pilot should fly the departure procedure as published, making a climbing right turn to overfly the approach end of runway 14 before proceeding to the Brute intersection. The pilot acknowledged that communication, but it was his last transmission. Several seconds later, the controller stated that he was receiving a low-altitude alert and that the airplane's altitude was showing 1,700 feet. He made several attempts to reach the pilot with no response. The airplane made a tight 360-degree turn and descended below the cloud layer. The airplane then climbed back into the cloud layer and made an inverted loop, descending into the ground in a near-vertical attitude. Investigators compiled a comparison of ADSB data from two airplanes that departed before the accident aircraft and two that departed afterwards. A comparison of flight tracks from the three airplanes that departed runway 14 revealed that the accident airplane had started its right turn earlier than the other three airplanes and the radius of its turn was tighter than the other three. The pilot was qualified and recently underwent recurrent training, but the reason the pilot became spatially disoriented could not be definitively determined. The pilot, age 69, had 2,167 total hours and 1,520 hours in the make and model. He'd flown just two hours in the prior 30 days, and he had a total of 273 hours in actual IMC. The logbooks indicated the pilot had departed from Medford in August 2018 and 2019 by way of the Jackson 1 and Eagle 6 departure procedures. In early November 2021, the pilot went to recurrent SimCon training. The training consisted of four flight hours, two hours of simulated IMC, both of which is in the same make and model. The pilot left the anti-collision lights on while in the clouds, which may have resulted in him having flicker vertigo. The airplane's POH states, Anti-collision lights should not be operating when flying through cloud, fog, or haze, since the reflected light can produce spatial disorientation. 
And according to a publication from the Flight Safety Foundation, quote, Flicker vertigo is an imbalance in brain cell activity caused by exposure to low-frequency flickering or flashing of a relatively bright light, such as a rotating beacon, a strobe light, or sunlight seen through a windmilling propeller. Flicker vertigo can result in nausea, dizziness, headache, panic, confusion, and in rare cases, seizures and loss of consciousness, which could result in a pilot's loss of control of an aircraft. And it also says... Flicker vertigo can also develop in someone viewing strobe lights or rotating beacons or their reflections off clouds or water. Probable cause, the pilot's failure to maintain aircraft control during the initial climb into clouds due to spatial disorientation, which resulted in an uncontrolled descent and collision with terrain. And let me just add a couple of comments. The pilot apparently didn't fully understand the departure procedure before he departed, as he didn't know that he was to initiate the climbing right turn on his own and not wait for the controller to tell him to turn. Now, I see a lot of pilots who will simply load a departure procedure and think that is sufficient. It is not. You have to also read the chart for the departure procedure and fully understand it. Unfortunately, it appears the pilot also banked too steeply in his right turn. I also want to mention that I once experienced extreme flicker vertigo. I was with a pilot flying an SR-22 at night doing instrument practice, and we were cleared for the ILS-10 right approach at Monterey, California. As we entered a cloud layer, the strobe light reflections off the cloud were totally blinding and instantly disorienting. I immediately got a headache and couldn't see or find the strobe light switch on the opposite side of the cockpit. I told the pilot to initiate a go-around, and we climbed back up out of the clouds and flew back to San Jose. At some point, he also managed to turn off the strobe lights. The strobe lights were so disorienting that there was just no way we could have continued to fly the approach with them on. So remember, please turn off your strobe lights when you're in the clouds. The next accident is one we talked about on this show nearly three and a half years ago. Its final report came out six months ago, but I just found it. This is about a Cirrus SR-22, November 607 Sierra Romeo, which descended into terrain following a night instrument approach into Lawrenceville, Illinois. The pilot departed Tampa, Florida at 8.46 p.m., flew more than four hours, flew past his home airport to buy cheap fuel at another airport, and then departed that airport at 2.11 a.m. to fly back to his home airport. During the hour he was buying fuel, the weather deteriorated. Had he flown the approach an hour earlier, the weather was reported at 1,200 overcast and six-mile visibility. But when he did fly the approach, the field was actually slightly below minimums for the approach. The approach minimums for the RNAV GPS-18 are 200 feet AGL and three-quarter mile visibility. At the time of the accident, the clouds were at 200 feet and visibility was one-half mile or a quarter mile less than required. But the big problem was that when the pilot flew this RNAV approach, he wasn't on the final approach course. Oddly, he flew a ground track that was parallel to and offset by six-tenths of a mile from the ground track. Now, that's extraordinarily unusual is the HSI would be fully off-scale during the approach, something any instrument pilot should notice instantly. And yet, this pilot descended as if he were on the glide path, down to LPV minimums, but offset from the final approach course. Now, there's only one way to think you're on the approach when the HSI needle is off-scale, and that's if you're looking at the moving map and not the HSI. As a flight instructor, I've had to tell instrument pilots a number of times to use the needles on their HSI or their CDI for primary course guidance so they can determine how far they are left or right of course, and to not use the moving map as their primary guidance for determining if they're on the center line of an instrument approach. But there's a new fact that came out from this final NTSB report, which offers a clue as to why the pilot didn't seem to realize that he was not on the final approach course. According to the report, quote, The pilot and another individual purchased the airplane on July 16, 2020, about six weeks before the accident. Through the Cirrus Embark training program, the pilot, with instruction provided by a Cirrus CSIP instructor, completed 4.5 hours of ground school and 12.2 flight hours in the accident airplane. The ground school and training flights were conducted on July 22nd and 23rd and August 13th and 14th. A review of the pilot's logbook, last entry was dated August 27th, revealing that he had completed 45.6 total flight hours in the accident airplane. Of those total flight hours, 9.1 were recorded as night flight time, 1.8 flight hours in actual instrument conditions, and 7 instrument approaches. The pilot's most recent 
IPC was satisfactorily completed on April 5, 2020 in a Beach BE-36 airplane. The day prior to the accident, the airplane's GPS NAVCOM system was changed to a new system. Based on available information, the accident approach was the pilot's second instrument approach flown with the new system. On August 28, 2020, an avionics company removed the Garmin GNS-430W and replaced it with an Avidyne IFD-440. Now that, by the way, would have been the day that he departed Tampa, August 28th, and he crashed a few hours later in the wee hours of the next day, August 29th. Probable cause, the pilot's controlled flight into terrain as a result of his failure to properly execute an instrument approach and maintain clearance from trees in night IMC. Contributing to the accident was the pilot's unfamiliarity with a newly installed avionics system. Now, let me add a couple of things. The aircraft departed at 8.46 p.m. Eastern Time and crashed at 2.23 a.m. Eastern Time. It crossed time zones just before the crash, so the crash occurred at 1.23 a.m. Central Time. Regardless, none of us are our best at 1 or 2 a.m. in the morning. And my personal minimum is that I don't fly after 11 p.m. at night. I am a night owl, but I know that I get tired and my performance degrades late at night. Second, this pilot was doing the hardest thing that pilots do. He was flying single pilot IFR at night when the weather was at minimums. And he was doing it at 1 or 2 a.m. in the morning, depending upon how you're counting. So he was compounding all of the major risk factors that you could have. Anytime you compound risk factors, you reduce your margin for error. In this case, everything might have gone fine, but there was one additional risk factor the pilot didn't account for, and that was the challenge of using new avionics. According to the NTSB, he had flown just one prior approach with the system, which must have been on the day that the avionics were installed. GPS navigators, as you know, are very complicated and you want to become very familiar with them before you start flying approaches to minimums. And if you don't know everything there is to know about the GPS and the aircraft you fly, make a resolution now to seek out the best possible instruction on the system so that you know it well. Now in a moment, I'll talk briefly about two other accidents for which final reports were issued in December. But first, let me highlight what I just said about this last accident, which is that you should seek out the best possible instruction for the avionics you fly with. We've talked about multiple accidents on the show where pilots clearly didn't know which buttons to push, and it led to an accident. Your goal as a pilot should be mastery of the aircraft, and you can't do that unless you know your avionics extremely well. So if you fly with a Garmin G1000, 3000, 5000, or the Perspective or Perspective Plus systems, and you don't know everything there is to know about these systems, I invite you to get a copy of one of my books. There are a couple of ways you can do that. I've told you in the past that you can use one of the links in the show notes to buy my books, or you can dial 800-247-6553 and get a copy that way. But I don't tell you often enough about another way you can get a signed copy of one of my books and support this show at the same time. You know that many listeners support the show via Patreon, but did you know that Patreon supporters can also listen to ad-free versions of every episode? And that if you sign up at the $50 a month level, after two months, I'll send you a signed copy of one of my books. So to do that, just go to aviationnewstalk.com slash support. Choose the Patreon option and sign up to support the show at whatever level you might choose. And if you sign up at the $50 a month level, I'll be sending you a signed book after two months. And you'll become a master at using your avionics. The next accident involves November 6796 November, a Mooney M20C and it occurred in Marana, Arizona on December 31st, 2021 at 1.30 p.m. The NTSB report says the pilot's family reported that he had departed Marana Regional Airport, AVQ, with an intended destination of French Valley Airport F-70 in California. Flight service was notified by concerned family that the pilot had not arrived and was overdue. The airplane wreckage was located by a search and rescue air unit the morning of January 4th. There are no known witnesses to the accident sequence. An animation of the flight track data with a weather overlay was also provided by search and rescue. The animation showed the airplane enter an area of weather, then enter into several turns before contact was lost. At the time of the accident, the pilot had accumulated about 540 total hours of flight experience, of which 4.5 hours were in simulated instrument conditions. Review of weather information near the accident location at the time of the accident indicated that IMC, including low ceilings and low visibility, 
were most likely present at the time of the accident. It's unknown if the pilot obtained a pre-flight weather briefing, and no air traffic control services were provided to the pilot during the accident flight. Postmortem toxicology testing revealed varying levels of methamphetamine in the pilot's liver and muscle tissue. The methamphetamine levels detected are consistent with the pilot's use of methamphetamine before the flight. It is likely that the psychoactive effects from the pilot's use of methamphetamine contributed to his decision to fly into conditions he was not trained for. Methamphetamine is a Schedule II controlled substance and is available in low doses by prescription to treat ADHD, ADD, obesity, and narcolepsy. It is also readily available as a street drug. Probable cause? The pilot's loss of airplane control due to spatial disorientation after entering IMC. Contributing to the accident was the pilot's impairment due to use of methamphetamine before the flight. Our final accident is a little different, though it does involve weather and loss of control. It involves November 88550, a Piper J3C, also known as a Piper Cub, and it occurred in Cynthiana, Kentucky, on August 3, 2022, at 5.25 p.m. The NTSB report says, about 5.10 p.m., the pilot and passenger departed the airport for a brief flight. About 10 minutes after departure, witnesses reported seeing a thunderstorm coming in from the south. The storm consisted of a wall of rain that they could see several miles out. There was also a rapid wind shift accompanied by an increase in wind speed, and the air temperature was dropping quickly. A witness reported that the airplane returned to the airport and flew an unusually low airport traffic pattern. The airplane approached the airport at low altitude, just over the trees from the north, and then made a left turn to join the left downwind leg of the airport traffic pattern for runway 29. The engine went to full throttle, but sounded like it was having trouble getting there and sounded warbly. The airplane then made a low approach, skipping the base leg, turning directly over the runway numbers. Then the airplane entered a descending left spin before impacting the ground adjacent to the runway. The witness further stated that the winds were picking up and it was gusty with a crosswind. Almost immediately after impact, heavy rain and wind began at the airport. As the pilot performed the low and non-standard approach, he likely turned steeply to the left, after crossing over the runway numbers, exacerbated by a left quartering crosswind during his turn, he exceeded the airplane's critical angle of attack and entered a stall and loss of control. The private pilot, a 62-year-old male, had an estimated 1,000 hours total time, 82 hours in the last 90 days, and 3 hours in the prior 30 days. And let me just add that, whenever possible, you should always try to fly a normal traffic pattern. Over the years, we've talked about a number of accidents that were immediately preceded by a non-standard traffic pattern. In this case, it's understandable that the pilot wanted to get on the ground as quickly as possible, but flying low and directly to the numbers complicated his approach. Even an emergency, or maybe especially an emergency, you'd ideally like to fly a standard traffic pattern if for no other reason than to reduce the number of variables that you have to deal with. When you fly a non-standard pattern, Power settings and turn radii have to be different, and they might not end up properly aligning you with the runway. Now, at the beginning of this topic, I mentioned I talked a little about the AOPA course. Here are some key takeaways from its summary. One, anytime the temperature is within a few degrees of the dew point, be on the lookout for IMC. Two, weather changes unexpectedly and forecasts are often wrong. Monitor your situation and act if things will change for the worst. Three, Proficiency deteriorates much faster than confidence. And around IMC, overconfidence will get you killed. And I love this one. Number four, the weather is what you find, not what was forecast. Smart pilots are always pessimistic about the forecast. Five, give yourself an out. That would be the plan B that I've talked about so often in the past. If you really need to get there, have an ironclad backup plan. Six, in trouble, use your autopilot and make sure ATC knows about the problem. Seven, remember what's at stake. No trip is worth dying for. So as I've said before many times, your goal should not be to get to your destination. Your goal for each flight should always be to make a safe landing somewhere. And just a reminder that I love hearing from you, and I read many of your emails on the show. If you'd like to send me a message, just go out to aviationnewstalk.com, click on contact at the top of the page, that's absolutely the best way to send me a message. And of course, I also want to thank everyone who supports the show in one of the following ways. We love it when you join the club and sign up at aviationnewstalk.com slash support to support the show financially. You can also do that at aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. 
We also love it when you leave a five-star review on whatever app that you're listening to us on now. And of course, if you're in the market for a headset, please consider buying a Lightspeed headset and using one of the links in our show notes, because if you use those links, they will donate to help support the show. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. And remember that you can always go around. You can always go around. If it don't look right, coming down. Don't wait until your silence may be sliding upside down.